You don't want to take your last breath and realize you've lived your life by compromising it in fear, or you believe the lies of the evil one. You're going to take your last breath when you stand in front of God and are held accountable for your life. You will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And our assessment has concluded that Nathaniel, Gareth, and Stacey Train acted as an autonomous cell and executed a religiously motivated terrorist attack. The family members subscribe to what we would call a broad Christian fundamentalist belief system known as pre-millennialism that comes from Christian theology. Now, I'm not an expert in that, but in its basic interpretation is that there was a belief that Christ will return to the earth for a thousand days and provide peace and prosperity, but it will be preceded by an era or a period of time of tribulation, widespread destruction and suffering. A range of different things help contribute to their belief in this system. Early speculation around the motivation was that it's centred on sovereign citizen ideology. Some of the behaviour was similar to what you see with sovereign citizen members. Being they had withdrawn from society, they were isolated, they were making plenty of comments about anti-government sentiment. But in all the examination of the material, we can't find anywhere where they declare themselves as sovereign citizens. They don't recognise the law of the state or the Commonwealth. They sometimes clear, declare their own sovereignty. We don't believe this was connected to a sovereign citizen ideology. We believe it's connected to the Christian extremist ideology. So I don't think there's any question that they would have known that at some point in time police were coming, but whether or not they would have anticipated it was specifically that day, uh, we wouldn't say that. But I, uh, you know, as I just outlined, the, the way that they had set their property up, there were clear indications that they had done a lot of planning. So it's fair to say that I suppose they were prepared for an ambush at some point in time, but maybe not specifically planned for this specific day. No specific luring with that missing person report. Yes, that's what we think at this moment. Remember, this is not Nathaniel's address. This is his brother's address. Um, and in fact, uh, we can see from uh, email contact between the two brothers that Nathaniel wasn't actually residing at the address. He, we, we think he might have been somewhere nearby, uh, maybe camping in bush, but not at the address. So we would have anticipated he'd had, would have had three firearms with him, the three firearms that were registered to him. And remember, he didn't have any other criminal history. Right? There was nothing to say, you know, this is a fellow who'd been a principal of a high school. He had no other criminal history. So there was nothing to indicate to the members that would have attended on that day that they were going to be ambushed. I play that for one reason. I play it because, um, you know, there's, there's reason to think that, you know, we're pretty similar to them in, in social structure, construct, everything. And a lot of people would think, oh, that would never happen here. And what we have is the reality of Christian men who've barely been engaged, if you want to call it that. And I want to show a couple other slides from some messages I've gotten over the last couple weeks, thanks to, uh, of all things, TikTok, which is just wild. And I've, I've also learned some things about TikTok recently about why they wanted to um, make such a big deal out of it, you know, compromising your data, everything else. It's also probably if there is such a thing as a free platform for communication, that's it. That's it all day long. But first and foremost, I want to give a little background. Um, in case any of you guys saw me last year, you know, I, I actually got chastised towards the end of the conversation with uh, a few of the other people here. So I'm a pastor's kid, but the bad kind, right? My horns held up my halo most of my life. Um, I swung for the rafters on everything. So if, if you're going to go, you know, big at six foot seven and two, 300 pounds, just go big. That's just what you do. And it's not from a cocky sense. It's just from a sense of like, all right, so God made me this size for a reason. And I'm just going to apply myself at everything. I was bored. I was a latchkey kid. And so I got, I got into a ton of trouble, got kicked out from junior high for fighting. The only way I got into high school is by playing football. I had no physicality. I finally get it back senior year, but just my life has been this thread of knowing that God is there, knowing that he's real. There's never a question of that, but just kind of like, you know, what can I get away with? What can I get away with? On the other hand, it was having these crazy dreams since I was five years old. Just dreams of just war, destruction, everything. 
And I'm like, okay, cool. I don't want any of that to happen. And so I'm going to avoid God as long as possible because the same person kept being in all the dreams. I've come to understand that it was like a future version of me in my dreams. And listen, if, we, if the Bible, if we, if we understand that the Bible is true, either all of it's true or none of it's true. Either God speaks to people in dreams and visions or he doesn't speak to people in dreams. Like there's no middle ground here. And I'm one of those weird Christians that takes the Bible literally. And it's weird these days because most people like to pick and choose the parts of the Bible that they like and they like to apply the hardest parts on other people and like to get just soak up the grace and mercy like a fire hose that will never run dry for ourselves. That, that, that sort of consumption, right, that means that we're consuming everything that Christ has to offer and we're contributing very little. What does that say about us? So I was that guy that avoided any sort of spotlight, any, especially the front row, and I've, I avoided the front row like the plague audibly heard God say for almost two years, starting 2014, 2015, stop hiding, stop hiding, stop hiding. And my, my wheelhouse was spiritual warfare. So 15 years ago, I finally woke up. So I've always woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. 15 years ago, I finally just go out and start walking. I was annoyed. I'm like, all right, man, I'm up. I'm up. What do you want? What are we talking about? And all of a sudden, this, this heart for prayer comes up. And so I get past all my superficial BS, and then I start praying for my pastor, in the church. So I get past myself, my family, I get all the usual things. So I'm praying more and more, and then all of a sudden go distance and time and years later, praying for the state, states, this nation, other nations. And so intercession, I just thought it was like this cheesy thing the old ladies did. I, I didn't like, and then you read enough of the Bible, you're like, okay, so what am I reading? Isaiah 59, the Lord looked and saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. It's four times in the Bible it says that the Lord was looking for someone. Isaiah 6, everyone knows. Who shall we send? Here I am, Lord, send me. It's cliche. Okay, then all of a sudden get to Isaiah 59. The Lord looked and saw that there was no man, wondered that there was no intercessor. Go to Ezekiel 22. It says the Lord looked for a man to build a wall and stand in the gap and repent on behalf of the land so that the, world wouldn't be or so that the land wouldn't be destroyed, and he didn't find one. And then even look at the Song of Songs. and talks about the man looked for a watchman. So if God's looking for men, what's the Bible telling us? Historically, they weren't there to be found. So we're actually trying to rise to the occasion that the Bible even tells us other generations struggled with. So what we're dealing with is nothing new. Even with the advent of technology, with the ubiquity of porn, it's nothing new. There were always men who were reluctant to actually do the things, the uncomfortable things that God's requiring and asking of us. And I'm hoping to God will change that. But... I show that video almost as a joke because it's a year ago and the lady obviously doesn't know much about Christianity. Like, she knows enough. But what's funny, they talk about it being an ambush attack. The cops went to the house. And the, and the media says, oh, they were ambushed. That's weird because it seems a little, you know, other way around. We see that the media is twisting things. The Bible is the only thing left that we have to cling to that can't be twisted and contorted, you know, contorted. And so my, my hope tonight is that I will leave you with the sense that the Bible is way more real, way more relevant than you've given it credit, and that you have to be the pastor six days a week. And the only way to do that is with your face in that book, on your knees in prayer, and charging forward like never before. That's where we'll start. But I'm going gonna, gonna to go even further. Father, in the name of Jesus, just... May the words out of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Don't let me screw up. Thanks. Amen. Um, all right, so August, <laughs> August 27th. Um, I spent the summer, uh, I'm going to preface this. The Bible talks about a time when kings went off to war. Does anyone know when that was? Okay, so that's when it started. When did it end? What ends tonight? Rosh Hashanah. So the cycle of warfare is in pleasant weather from spring, from spring to fall. The kings met back at, in Jerusalem at fall, and they actually planned where they were going to go to war the following year. So they took all, all fall to prepare, to stock up, to train, because the men knew that they were going to have to be back on the battlefield. And so I'm looking at this like, I hope to God we have a reprieve, and I'm going to explain what I've been doing for the last few months and kind of give some pictures that just still make me laugh because it wasn't my idea. It's all above my pay grade. And 
I'm a, a big fan of intercession, so I wake up usually about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I start walking and praying. And it's not like, dear baby infant Jesus. It's like, no, I'm, I'm weaponizing the word of God as we're instructed and making declarations. I'm not a guy that prays for myself. And, and my guys know that. So I run a Bible study online. My guys know that. So that, thank God they cover me. But I also don't ask for prayer. If anything, I'll say, listen, if you feel led, be in agreement with me on this thing that I'm about to do or that I'm praying against or walking against or warring against. If you don't feel led, don't say a freaking word. I don't need a, I don't need a spirit that's speaking against it or thinking like that's crazy or doesn't make sense or there goes Steve, he's, he's off on another thing. And so I'll, I'll start my summer in reverse. About 36 hours ago, I was in the middle of southern France next to Mayer in Switzerland, right next, walking right next to a cornfield in pitch black darkness on my way to find what I understood and what I found out to be the control center for the CERN facility, Switzerland. And listen, we don't need to go full rabbit hole, right? But we're going to go just, just, just partial rabbit hole. Show of hands. Anyone have an idea what CERN's been up to? All right. So let's just say this. There's witchcraft, right? Let's say that there's scientific witchcraft. Let's say there's a bunch of people with no heart for God, no acknowledgement of what the Word of God says. They don't fear God. That's the main component. If you don't fear God, you're going to do whatever your little heart desires. You learn a bunch of things, do a bunch of things, and the fear of the Lord in Proverbs is the beginning of knowledge. So you can learn everything. You just have no idea which end is up. And you have no idea when you've crossed lines and you've gone too far, and so you start doing, you know, planning technology and building technology to murder babies more effectively and to cut off genitalia and to... Why would someone create a puberty blocker? Why does that even exist? We're talking about whether or not it should be used, but why did someone create it? Okay, science. It's witchcraft. It's a dark art that's applied with no stopgap, and no, no, no one stops says, like, wait a second. Just because we can do this, should we do this? No one says a word. Why? Because they're, they're all just this echo chamber of godlessness. And so we wonder how we got here. And so CERN is doing something called they're harnessing dark matter. And they've identified that they can harness it. They've opened portals. This is on their official letter. Just go and look at this. So they call themselves an, an atomic research agency, but they're harnessing dark matter. They've opened portals. They identified that there is dark energy and they are hoping to discover things that have never been discovered before. And they're hoping to be surprised by pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope. So 36 hours ago, before I jumped on a plane to come here, I was walking around in the middle of a pitch black, you know, cornfield in southern France, praying around this facility, because this is what I do, because this is how crazy I am about the word of God and where God's driven me. So if you want to leave after that, I totally respect it, by the way, because that's like the crazy train for, for most people who, who still pray these little prayers saying, God, help me. And my, my, my worst fear is that we're going to die and other men Maybe men in this group will end up standing before God and he will give you a highlight reel of all the times that you prayed for help and all he's going to do is stare at you in the eyes and then point to his son on the cross that conquered the grave to give you all power, authority, and dominion that Adam screwed up and lost for us. And what are you going to say? But no, no one told me. No one told me I was supposed to. But, but you, David asked for help. But he also did what? He did the work. He also declared things. He also crapped the bed and went too far and did things that, that cost him. If, if everyone understands the whole story of David, what's the one thing that he wanted to do was to build a house that housed the presence of God. What did God say? You can't do that because of too much bloodshed. There's a cost. So all of us had to understand there's a cost. So let's look at that, but let's still look what he did. There's a heart for God. That's what I have. I also have a very profound understanding and respect of prayer because I've done more than my fair share. And I'm not up here saying, like, look at me, click on my heels. I'm not trying to get any sort of acknowledgement for it. If it were up to me, I wouldn't be up on the stage. I'd just be out there doing the thing. But other people that are in my circle have said, right, you need to be out there doing the thing. So here I am. So I'm going to show you a picture on the screen and zoom in. So between... 5 a.m. August 27th and 5 a.m. August 28th. Seventy-six thousand steps. 
538. If you do the math from my, from my frame, it's approximately 36 miles. I found out I took the meandering way around the entirety of Manhattan Island. Yeah, not my idea, by the way. Geez, that's exactly what I thought. Because my plan was to do 22 miles where I went from Wall Street on the south, up the east side, cut over the top of Central Park, and then down. And then all of a sudden, I get to the top of Central Park. I started at 10.30 in the morning. Like, oh, I just need like seven hours. I'll be fine. I can, I can walk full speed for that. And I can. And all of a sudden, I get, I get to 110th Street, and I keep walking past it. That was my cutoff. And I go and I sit on the side of this little park where a bunch of homeless people were doing the horrible things to themselves and each other. And I walk past it, and it's maybe 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm just like, all right, God, I'm cool, right? We're good. I can just cut across. No peace, no answer. I'm like, shit. I text my pastor, buddy. I've been with him all, all, all summer. Basically, I felt like God wanted me to be in New York to back him up. And so I said, hey, man, I just, I just want to get godly counsel. You feel like there's something I can just cut across Central Park and I'm good? He knew the, he knew the idea, the original motivation for it. It was, you know, a good idea in merit. And he's like, yeah, of course. And then five seconds later, I see the dot, dot, dot on my phone. I'm like, no. No, don't, no, don't do it, don't do it. He's like, actually, I think you're supposed to walk around the entire thing. So next thing you know, I start at 10.30. I get back to my original spot at 4 o'clock in the morning the following morning. Is, you can see the steps, right? Does that look like a steady, consistent speed of walking? No, it looks like my giant self got slower and slower and slower along the way. And that little last blip is me barely making it home. It probably took me 45 minutes to go less than half a mile from where I ended to the front door of my building. A week before this, I was on the subway, and I almost killed a, a homeless guy. No joke. I almost killed a guy. I sat on his half of the subway car, and, I, of course, I walk in. I didn't realize why. Everyone else was huddled on the other side. So this, this guy was pretty violent. So there's women, there's kids, there's families, and there's probably like eight grown men. And so I sit too far on his side, and as the train starts going, then he starts yelling. So he, the guy gets up. He's within maybe a foot of me, and then I stand up, and then he gets even closer. He pushed me. I'm like, bro, go to your corner. I'll go over there. We're cool. You're cool. I'm cool. Everything's cool. He's like, no, man, you're going to go down. You're going to be on that floor. I'm going to kill you. And I'm like, I don't think you're going to do that. At least not without a fight. Next thing you know, I hear this voice out of the corner. And think about it, this is New York. Everyone's seen the videos and the news stories from New York. Like we know, like this place is, it's, it's about to be escaped from New York. This, this older black gentleman, and the homeless guy was black, and there was a guy named Daniel Penny that actually killed a homeless black guy on the train and is now in jail, incarcerated, and the odds don't look good for him. He was defending himself, and everyone said the same thing on the train. So this black guy says, sir, please stand down, walk away from him, don't hurt him, and then he starts saying, don't kill him. Don't kill him, don't kill him. And so about maybe a minute later, I end up slowly walking backwards, I go to my side, and the guy actually goes to the corner, but he's slowly saying, I'm still going to kill you, still going to kill you, still going to kill you. And so going to his corner, this gentleman looks at me and says, I think you passed the test today. So he was happy I didn't kill a homeless guy that was threatening to kill me and threatening everyone else on the train, unbeknownst to me. The guy ended up telling me this in the discourse. And I said, sir, I think you failed yours. Why is it that, and I told him this to his face, so why is it that every single man didn't get up and push this guy in a corner, in a headlock, kick him off the train? And I looked at the woman to his right. I said, ma'am, are you scared? She's like, I'm terrified. I looked to the father across the way, and he just shrugs, he shrugs his shoulders. And I looked at the man across from me, and I said, the reason why this city has fallen is because good men are doing nothing except telling someone that can do something about it to just sit down and walk away. That's what society is doing. That's what a godless society is doing that just wants to make everything and think and hope th something's going to go away. And the word of God already tells us it's not going away. So then what does the word of God say? I'm going to segue to my notes. I'm going to start this, and this is kind of going to be the main theme for everything. And I, I get weird, and I open my Bible, and I start talking from my Bible sometimes. Romans 8, 19, creation eagerly waits for the arrival of the sons of God. If you can focus on one verse to be your motivation for a world that's completely falling apart, it's that. 
So, so Paul, in the letter to the Romans, oh, that's weird. America is like, you know, watching Rome burn with Wi-Fi, okay? Paul is reminding the Christians within Rome, because, right, this letter is to Christians, that the whole world is waiting for us to emerge. And it has been waiting for us to emerge. So what are we doing? And this is where, this is where even more indictment comes in. That's my beautiful video, my train ride, <laughs> driving or actually training from Rome into Switzerland, right? It's amazing. And of course, just proof of life. It's a certain facility right up there. Short video, I went inside afterwards. The control center, that's where it is in Prevacin. You have to walk through the checkpoint. I think it was me talking to my guys. But I want to read some messages. I'm going to read some messages from women. And for some reason, over the last couple of weeks, TikTok, half a million views and, and a ton of messages and ads. But I want to read to you what women are saying about the videos that I'm posting. Have any of you seen some of my videos? A little guttural? Good. Hopefully, like, only, like, two because I kind of get a little angry at them sometimes. All right, I'm going to read this. For the first time, I prayed against evil. It felt so different, but right. Do you know of a female mentor as enthusiastic as you? I'm a 58-year-old woman with grandchildren, but I have already done battle with the enemy, saving my children, rebuking Satan's influence against their and my marriage. But now I feel called to give our Lord a safe place to come again. I finally understand what praying violently means. Thank you for being uncomfortable and doing these videos. My next obedient task has been laid out for me as a result. I'm not getting these messages from men. I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep going, but this, this is why. Good morning. Before going to sleep last night, I was praying and telling God I wanted to do more, asking him to guide me in the direction I needed to go to be a warrior for Christ. This is a woman saying this. I have personally felt and seen God's blessing in my life, and I truly want to return the blessings in honor of him. I couldn't sleep and was scrolling, and the second reel I saw was one of yours. I will see you in Armageddon. I know in my heart, my mind, God led me to you. Everything you are saying is true. It's your message I needed to hear. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Heard the message. I'm taking notes, and I'm going to be boots on the ground in his name. Next one. Any word or one word? How? Question mark. I'm ready but older. A woman, mother, and grandmother. How do I raise to a higher level? I've asked to be used, filled with his spirit, used as the vessel he created me to be. I'm not okay with status quo. I want to do more. Anyway, you probably will never see this, but God will. That broke my heart. All right, this one. How do I help you? Or to help someone like you who needs someone creative on their team with design, problem solving, and editing skills. I know my life has more purpose than what I've done and offered in the past. I'm meant to use my skills to do God's work. Your videos move me and are the type of thing I need to be involved with something similar. I'm a woman, I'm a woman warrior of God in Canada. And then this one. This one's going to be close to home. I made a video for women. It's like 16 minutes. And I, just Holy Spirit just had me go a different route. I need to make... I, a follow-up, but this just actually hit a couple hours ago. Thank you for making a video for us women and your softer delivery for us. I've been watching the videos for the men. It's blowing my mind how much I'm learning and what's being revealed from them just in the last four days. And I see that the delivery for the men is stronger and much needed. Praying for your endurance, God's clear pathway and communication to you, protection, Holy Spirit's leading, discernment and guiding us to what's next. As a single female in Huntington Beach, and my family in Australia, it's sometimes daunting out there, riding solo, and I need as much as God's covering as possible. How many of you are married? Show of hands. How many of you have daughters? How many of you have granddaughters? The world on its current path or where your daughters and granddaughters are going to be posting messages on someone else's video because men still aren't stepping forward. What do you want? You want another pancake breakfast? What do you, what do you want? You, you want another just high five? You want another lifestyle message from church on how to give tithe? You, you want to hear more relevant messages on how not to masturbate. You want to hear more the lowest level possible communication from church leadership to an army of God in waiting. 
And all they do is keep balancing the ball at the lowest possible level of what you can possibly handle because unlike elementary school, show of hands, how many of you still go back to elementary school teachers and ask questions? Oh, that's weird. Well, how many of you keep needing to hear the same word of God preach from the pastor on Sunday? Okay, so what you don't do in the natural sense, because you're so mature and you've, you've aged well and you've learned well, you need from the house of God. Why? Everyone's got a reason why. I'm not going to indict people, but it's between you and God. How many of you have memorized more sports statistics than Bible verses? How many of you have memorized more song lyrics than Bible verses? How many of you can barely, barely get through a Sunday service and worship for 20 or 30 minutes, which is really just praise. It's not even worship. Abraham said when he was about to go sacrifice his son that that's how, what he considered worshiping God. So that already tells us God considers our sacrifice worship. So when we're just praising, how many of you guys actually praise all throughout the week? All the time. Because you know that a life of warfare is a life of praise. Okay, so you have to be asked the hard questions and the church won't give you the hard questions because the church's measure of discipleship is to teach you and raise you up to be kept and a good member tither. That's weird. What did Jesus say discipleship was? I'm going to teach you to be sent. How many churches, most men here go to church, how many have been raised, taught, and sent out? Instructed to be sent. Your pastors aren't bad dudes. Well, maybe most of them. I just I don't I know who your pastors are. And I'm saying this not not to be. I'm not trying to indict the church because the church has done it to itself. I'm here to light a fire in you to realize that you have to become the church worthy of a king's return. And this is the biggest kicker, and it's what your pastor is not going to tell you. Jesus isn't returning to a four wall church. Whatever church you go to, Jesus isn't going to walk in those doors and say everyone here is good. How many parables do you need to read if you've even read the parables and then studied them? Parables of 10 virgins, or yeah, the uh, 10, yeah, virgins with oil, right? Five without and five with. So at the time that their master came back, five of them, half of them, 50% of the body did not have oil in their lamps, and it was displeasing to their master, and they were cast out. You want math? It's easy. And the Bible reminds us, many will cry out, Jesus' own words, he'll cry out, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you. What are you going to do? Both the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 3.15, and the book of Hebrews, like chapter 3 or 4, says you're going to have to give an account for everything, and not just the bad things that you do in life. God's going to look at you like of all the moments I put you there to live a faith-filled, spirit-led experience. What did you do? You kept to yourself. You didn't speak up. You didn't warn people. You didn't want to be an asshole. Didn't want to be a jerk. Didn't want to offend someone. Didn't want to, you know, upset your friends. You felt like it was the wrong thing to say in, in time and place. And then what? Ezekiel is still true. It's much for you, for me, it's for anyone else. If you don't warn people of the path that they're on, God holds their blood on your hands. So not only do you have to count for your sin, you have to count for the fact that you didn't warn people about theirs. What do you need? You need to be motivated. Why? When the disciples asked their teacher, right, to help them increase their faith, what did Jesus' response, like Luke 16 or 17, maybe 17? He, sa- he goes through this little list of parables. And then he says, if all you've done is the bare minimum of what I told you to do, you have to say that you've been unprofitable for nothing. And it's an interesting little parallel that he gives us. And the word, I actually love that word, unprofitable. Right? You've been, you've been unprofitable for anything. I have, a, I have a friend, Noah Elias. He had this analogy, and I've heard it before, but he's the last one to say it, so I'll give him the credit for it. And what's cool is he gave this analogy about God as your primary startup investor in life. Right? For I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. And what's funny is that what happens with most startup businesses if they blow up? They kind of they blow off the first early investor. 
until something goes wrong, something goes sideways, and then who's the first person that they usually go back to crawling on their hands and knees when things go belly up? The first investor that believed in them. So that's like God's grace and mercy, right? It's been a fire hose that we've left wide open for decades. While women have been responsible for carrying the church forward for easily the last 50 or 60 years. Easily. Men stepped out. First on, first on the house of God. Then on the house. Then on the wife. Then on the kids. And then they just left. It's not just stepping out occasionally, moonlighting. No, they just left the house of God. Left the home. Left the wife. Left the kids. Now we're left with fatherlessness. And the curse that's talked about in Malachi 4. But if God's the greatest investor in your life, what does an investor want to see? A return on investment. A profit. And what are you doing? How many of you guys would be guilty of what Jesus said when you've been unprofitable for anything? Because you're barely able to do the bare minimum of the obedience that he's required to you. And by the way, obedience, mention the Old Testament and New Testament. For any of you that want to put up your hand saying like, no, but the New Testament, it's just wiped out the old and it's fine. Then all of a sudden you have Romans 15, 4. What was written of old is useful for instruction. So how many people are just banking on the fact and hoping to God that his mercy never runs out? So you're barely able to be in relationship with God. Okay, so how many of you show of hands? You want to honor God? Anyone? What I'm trying to help you understand is that there's such a rudimentary level of applying our faith and then what, what do you have? Like, I'm trying to give you guys something that you can exchange this, this kind of existence for where you're barely getting by and the women of God have to step forward as warriors because the men of God are still figuring out where to, when to get off the couch. They're trying to go back to church and get another lifestyle message or do the next breakfast or barely get to a men's gathering. And they don't, they don't bring other men together outside of when they're forced to or when someone else organizes it. They're not trying to build Christian community, then influence things. And we're wondering why the school system has gone sideways. We are the problem. We're it. And the pastor's not going to tell you because as soon as the pastor tells you, you're going to look to him saying, like, why didn't you tell us more? What's he going to say? Well, because I need you to be a good member tither. Because you can barely handle the lessons, the, the little, the, the slow softball pitches he sends you at a level three, right? There's a, there's a faith, right? One to ten. One is you believe in God, but you hate him. Two is you believe in him, but there's a bunch of baggage and noise you got to get through. And then three is your barely entry level faith. And then there's ten, right? Spiritual gifts from three. Spiritual gifts get you to ten. There's nine spiritual gifts. How many of you are operating in spiritual gifts? Praying in tongues? Healing people? Okay. How many of you want to? Show of hands. Okay, so when the Bible says be zealous for, for spiritual gifts, why isn't every hand here that's up for saying do you want to? Okay, show of hands. Who here is righteous? So why isn't every single arm raised in this place? You don't even know who you are. Yeah, okay, so, and, and that's, this is a rubber meets the road. Okay, so you say that. You say you're in Christ. You say you're a Christian. You say you follow Christ. And what did Jesus himself say? You'll know my followers by what? No, that's a, no, uh, it's different. No, no. That's, that's one thing. What, what else? No, it's, it's very specific. You will cast out devils. You will heal the sick. You will raise the dead. You will cleanse the lepers, you will handle snakes, and not die, and drink poison and not die. How many people have memorized or have spoken Psalm 91 over their life? Like the blanket psalm of like King David's, you know, promise of protection. Show of hands. Come on. Show of hands. Psalm 91. Nobody? It's a few people. So I'm going to present you with, with a biblical principle, and I, I hope that it takes root. How many of you have prayed for strength? And so you realize the way that, that God usually works is he gives you opportunities to exercise strength that's above what you currently have, and that's exactly how you end up getting heavenly strength. Endurance, building it. Faith is like a muscle. It has to be exercised. Okay, so when, 
when, when it says we're going to handle serpents and not die, Psalm 91, 13. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the dragon. What if I told you that when you pray for things, God's going to only give you the thing that you're praying for, especially when it's for strength and, and fortitude and things like that, and endurance, because he's about to present you with things to exercise that strength and that fortitude and that endurance. The story of Abigail and David and Nabal. Abigail was you know, married to Nabal at the time, but she ends up getting to this point where David basically says he's not going to kill Nabal after all because she had brought him like food and, and water for his men. And she makes a statement. How many of you want to have an enduring house? If, if time gets get hard, if, if right, the book of Revelation continues to be read out loud, show of hands, enduring house. Everyone? Some of you? Okay, so what if I told you the only place in the Bible that, that, that tells you how that is? is Old Testament. Abigail says to David, for my Lord, God, has made for my Lord David an enduring house because David fights the enemies of the Lord and evil is not found in him all of his days. It's a declaration as well as a future indictment. Who here is fighting the Lord's enemies in society and culture? Or who's here just trying to just go through life and, and just trying to not make as much noise and just trying to like handle you and Okay, so here's another question. Who's ready to pick a fight? I I don't need to go and show you slides of, of my health count and how many other miles I've walked. But I, I will show you just to, you know, add insult to injury because I'm cute like that. Okay, so what does that look like to anyone? What does that look like in the background? Does it look like Psalm 115, Second Chronicles 10? Declarations, Father, declare the mighty name of Jesus. I walked around the Vatican for 13 days. And I'm going to show you one video as, as just give you some motivation. God already told me why and what we were doing. So that was kind of between my guys and I. But I want to show you, um, I want to show you an interesting video. And I'm going to zoom in. Show of hands. Anyone seen the movie Sound of Freedom? Okay, so it's kind of like a deal. Right? So has anyone seen what, what physically happens to young infants and toddlers when they get sexually assaulted? It's called panda eyes. On the outside, I'm a chaplain for several groups that do anti-human trafficking. And so we've been having some very interesting conversations. I've been read in for years. Seeing some pictures I can never unsee. Reviling pictures that literally will turn your blood boil and, and turn that passage through where it says, you have not yet strived against sin as to the shedding of blood. Which means you haven't yet resisted sin without killing people. I felt that. So I'm going to show you a video. And you're going to say, like, wait, how is that even there? How many of you know when the Vatican was made? The approximately. 1500s? Anyone? 1500s. So the whole top of St. Peter's Basilica. It's a glass mosaic, which means all the artwork inside, it's not painting, so you don't have to repaint. It's just, it's this glass tile, and it's meticulously put together, painstakingly thought out, methodical, laid out, measured out, everything. So when I tell you, and the reason why I told you that, Toddlers and infants get this panda eye thing, this puffy eye thing, and they just have this look of despondency. I'm going to show you what's in the roof of the Vatican. That's me, my giant face, because I talk at the camera. Okay, and we're going to go forward, okay? What does that look like? Why is there a picture of a kid, in mosaic tile, with a bunch of angels in between at the top of St. Peter's Basilica? Oh, wait, okay, so that's one, okay? That's a crest, right? By the way, everyone know the prophecy of Nostradamus? The two popes and the black pope? So you have to Google this. The tour guide told me this. Nostradamus, and this is where biblical prophecy is coinciding and, and laying over with worldly prophecy. Nostradamus says at one point in time there will be two popes, which is never the case. A pope dies, and the next one comes into power. It says there's going to be two popes. One will die, the black pope will be left, and then the end of the world will come. So the current pope, Pope Francis, in 2015... He was the head of the Jesuit order. The head of the Jesuit order for centuries has been called and known as the Black Pope. And this dude dismissed it like, it's fine. Just said the end of the world, but you know, you just never know. 
You don't know. And then I'm, and this, he tells me this beforehand. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, look, that looks like a black creature on top of a gold dragon. Oh, Satan dragon. Okay, so I don't know. I, again, you don't want to draw conclusions. You want data. You want information. And so what do I do? I keep, I keep going along the top of the basilica. Okay? So I'm going to scroll, scrolly, scrolly, scrolly. Okay? One kid. Doesn't look good. Don't like it. Looks like the crest of an animal that's mounted after a hunt. Don't like it at all. Oh, look. Angel. Beautiful angel. Gold. Next kid. Wait, that's a different kid's face. And it's, it's a church. It's the center of the Roman Catholic Church that they say is the center of all Christianity. Second kid, okay. That, that's just got to be weird, right? That's third kid. Okay, and so we're only accessing half of this. Wait, there's a fourth kid with a different face. Oh, okay, okay, crest, don't know what that means. Another kid. Oh, an angel. How about that one? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy realist at this point, as all of you should be. And the biggest conspiracies that are coming true are in the Word of God. That most of you don't memorize, don't read, don't, don't meditate on, don't pray on, don't declare, don't weaponize. And so you're barely able to go Sunday to Sunday to Sunday to Wednesday to men's group to this, that, and the other, and maybe talk about a few verses and chapters here and there. And none of you can ever brush up against your pastor and say, Pastor, you're going on the weak side of faith when we should be at war. Why? Angel, another kid with a different face. Okay. That, that. I, I couldn't stay up there much longer. I couldn't. So what have we covered so far? I do weird things like walking and praying and declaring God's word. I go places all around the world, which has just been a, a random thing of doing. So I've done this in Jerusalem, Washington, D.C. So the, the, the way that the time frame worked, since June, I've been in New York City, help, hanging out with the buddy, sharpening one another. He lost his lease on a building and where his church was and um, ended up basically taking his, his people to the, the subway system. His whole church went to the subways. And, and basically, that's like a recipe for just losing your church instantly. The subways in New York City, by the way, they did it on the biggest parade day of, of, of Pride Month. They went to Times Square. Talk about a big Christian set of balls, right? And, of course, and I'm sitting there like, this is going to be awesome. And he's like, I don't want to talk to you right now. Because, like, his thing is, like, and he'll admit it, it's public shame. He doesn't want to be shamed publicly. And I'm like, dude, this is territory. You're the only person that's actually out here claiming territory and not sounding like an idiot with some, with some like, oh, I'm just going to be down here with, you know, a yellow vest on claiming Jesus loves you amidst like a bunch of gay people that want to kill you. No, he, had, he held full-blown church, keyboards, guitars, bass, drums, little PA, got away with it. He's also an attorney, so he kind of knew how to navigate this. But I say this because it started in New York, goes all the way through. I end up walking around Manhattan, had no intention of doing it. The very next day, I'm in D.C. Actually, sorry, a week later, Friday later. So I do that on Sunday to Monday. Friday, I'm getting my passport in Washington, D.C., and I walk all along the mall like I've done with other groups. And so then 24 hours later, I'm on a jet, and I'm flying to the Vatican, and I'm doing this around the Vatican. I do that for 13 days. 12 is the number of government. And so I knew, I knew what God was asking me. Like, we're basically dethroning the government. I'm trying to buy time. And I'm doing this from a, a little Christian reclusive, like, I'm cool with all this going kinetic because I have more and maybe more tools than the average person has and more, maybe more freedom seeds than the average person has, right? But I know it's still not going to be enough because if I don't have the spiritual fiber and standing behind it and I think I can go weapons hot and things will go kinetic and I can just start shooting people randomly, sorry, that's, that's murder. It's not righteous war. So all of us, by the way, Revelation 18 reminds us when Babylon falls, that's when we respond back. In the Bible, the whole message for us is clear. We don't start things, but we finish them. And the only people that finish this on the right side with Christ are people. And so I'm here to give you a warning, a wake-up call. God is not returning back to the four-wall church. He's returning back to his people. And so the longer that you keep thinking you can just go to church and not become church, 
you're lying to yourself. And the longer that you keep thinking, you don't have to rise in your faith and build your faith and grow your faith and be a spiritual Viking, bloodthirsty for demonic activity and engagement so that you can be sharpened and you can endure. The ceiling of your faith becomes the stunt of your family's faith, which means your family's faith will likely never transcend yours. How many of you have wives where their spiritual faith is actually probably what kept the wheels on the bus? Probably they were the ones that were faithful. They were the ones that kept praying. They were the ones that kept saying, we need to go to church. We need to do this. We need to do that. How many of you are still trying to play catch up? What motivation do you need? The world's going to shit. And listen, I'm, again, I'm still that guy that cusses. And why? I've seen too much. I've done too much. I've fought too much. I, I can tell you right now, CERN, that part of, of France I was walking in, which ended up being what I, what I found to be like the headquarters of their control center. That's probably the most spiritually dark place I've ever been, been in my life. I've been walking around Jerusalem by myself from, you know, midnight to 6 o'clock in the morning. Seeing more sunrises there, it's probably the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, where the sunrise just comes over the Mount of Olives. And I'm not saying, again, there's no feather in my cap. Every single day, God's mercy renews morning by morning. Manna from heaven fell morning by morning. Spiritual warfare resets every single morning. Either you're going to rise up to be a watchman on the walls of your, your own faith, your family's faith, your home, then the church, then the community, then the, then the region, or you're just going to be playing status quo, and you're going to leave here the same way that you came in. That choice is up to you. I'm still going to be doing my thing. God and I are just going to probably be on a, on, a, on a marathon and just doing a bunch of weird things. That's just kind of how this works. I, I don't say this because I take pride in it, but what I'm looking at are a bunch of dead people. I'm looking at, at, at dead men walking. And all you guys came in here. You're going to get loud. You're going to clap. You're going to do your thing. You're going you're to go through the motions, right? Some food. And by the way, if this, if this puts you off any of you that bad, like we'll give you your money back all day. I actually gave them cash at the front just to make that happen. Like, I'm, I'm actually here not to, if I have one hope that the Holy Spirit's put on my heart, I don't want any one of you, not a single man, to leave here the same way that he came in. And if that means I piss you off, that means I, 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 I somehow offend you, amen. I'm the guy that has to wake up about 7 o'clock in the morning. I slept through my alarm because I also set my alarm for 3 o'clock, so I don't want to miss a day. So it's probably about maybe four years ago. I wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning after my alarm's going off, and it hits snooze about 50 times. And I, I go back to bed again, and then I have this little mini dream where God is walking at me in heaven, and he's pissed. And he has something in his hand. I'm like, oh, hey, God. I'm like, oh, wait, we're not happy. Okay, what's up? He's walking right at me, and all of a sudden he takes out this piece of paper, and he's bringing it to me, and then he brings it to this kind of like to my left. So I'm here, and I'm looking at this. I'm like, wait, where's it going? And all of a sudden, I see Satan standing right next to me. And then I look back. I'm like, wait a second. Why is he, why is he here? And I look at the paper. It just says, pass on it. And God never loses eye contact with me the entire time. So what God basically told me was that morning, I just decided to hit snooze. I just gave Satan a pass. So when I'm talking to you like this, that's, that's the normal communication that I have with God in dreams, audibly, everything. It's just, it's just how it goes. I've spent more time alone with God in the last 15 years than I have probably with people, to be, to be quite honest. I, almost in a way, not by choice. But when you start praying for God's anguish, what happens? He shows up, and then what do you do? The Bible talks about how Isaiah even had to get away in the heat of his spirit for seven days. Ezekiel, something similar. Like you get so overwhelmed with just the fact the Holy Spirit is so real and present and we have to go a distance and he's bringing you to a place where you're supposed to go an even greater distance and you're like, wait a second, I just want to get a little more sleep. Wait a second, I just went to bed late. Wait a second, all these things. And something weird happened and it, it's, I almost kind of like forgot about talking about it. So when I was on that walk and I'm walking around New York and listen, New York is a dumpster fire. I mean, that thing is a, is a cliche meme as it gets. And I'm like, wait a second, why did Ezekiel 2230 come to mind? And then it's like, we pray for our enemies. I, I always pray for our enemies. And something I've learned in spiritual warfare, you have to pray for the soul to get saved. So all those people, especially the tour guides and the people I met at CERN, they have no idea that they're actually betraying and defying God's natural order of things. Right? God created natural barriers between the natural and the supernatural. What do drugs do? What does alcohol do? 
You get a head change. You break through the border from the natural to the supernatural. What is science doing? Breaking through the barrier between the natural and the supernatural. What is men, you know, mindfulness, yoga, what is, you know, all these things that, that we call new age that, that a lot of women and even a bunch of men too are going down this path where they're putting like, oh, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian, but I also do this because it's fun and works. I do this thing. My, my girlfriend's like it. My guys, you know. So we're not even loyal. We cover ground. We realize that if we don't even, you know, if we don't even just obey the bare minimum, we're, we're not profitable for the kingdom of heaven. We want to honor God. And yet we get past this fact that we can't even spend time in his word, unhurried, unrushed, memorized time where the word of God sits in us and dwells in us so deeply that we want to go to war every single day with ourselves if we have to, because a lot of us have to. And then we get to go pick a fight. Otherwise, what happens? The women, the women pick the fights because there are no men that are picking fights. That's, that's the weight of American Christian culture. We are such an insulated group of disengaged, disavowed human beings as it relates to, to who we are in relationship to our God. And here's why. How many of you have listened to Christian radio? Okay. Christian concerts? Okay. Uh, Christian television shows? Christian movies? Okay. Okay. So Christian groups, small groups, friend groups, right? So we've all of a sudden created and allowed these little Christian bubbles to exist. Well, that's so cute. We're cute. Look at that. It's so great. It's like you go from like Christian thing to Christian thing to Christian thing. Oh, there's homeless people outside. Sorry, my window's up. I can't hear you. Bye-bye. I don't have money for you right now. We're so insulated. While the world is going, it's just completely falling apart. We're not, we're not raised and taught to be sent. We're taught to be kept. We love being kept. We love being coddled. The women are looking for men. So all of you that have daughters, have you talked to your daughters a real conversation if they're of that age where they're actually like in the dating pool? Hope to God you can find a dude at church, but guess what? 50%, 50% of all young men under the age of 25 right now can't have an erection without Viagra or some sort of other Viagra product. 50%. So medicine's coming for our kids. Food's coming for our kids. What they're putting in the air is coming for our kids, right? The enemy's coming for our kids. The school boards are coming for our kids. Predators, right? The San Francisco gay, around, gay men's like corral, I think it was like two or three years ago, came up with that video in a song where they're singing, we're coming for your kids. And then they chant that again this summer in New York City during the gay parade. So everything's coming for your kids. And so how many of you hope that your daughters will find a nice, good, solid Christian guy that's unaffected by all this trash? It's not going to happen. If as many of us are dealing with sexual depravity in the throes of what we're dealing with there, we can barely get past it. So all of us just keep bouncing around. So the messaging keeps going on this baseline thing. It's still very real and practical. It has to be addressed. But at what point do you not pick a fight and go to war and destroy all these things? Because what does the Bible say? You can wage war against disobedience only once your obedience has been attained. I don't know what you're waiting for. The exchange is apathy for war. The exchange has always been apathy for war, lethargy for war, being asleep. And you look at 2 Corinthians and it says... Don't have communion if you're not fully resolved with God because one of three things happens. Sickness, weakness, and sleep. What is the current American church? Sick, weak, and asleep. How much more of the dead church do you need to see till you realize God is not coming back to a dead church full of people that have the potential. So yes, every four-wall church has a potential. I'm not crapping on pastors. Pastors have enough on their plate because they're running a business, because they're trying to be as relevant, passionate, engaged, spirit-filled, spirit-led as much as possible. It's on you to be the pastor six days a week. And so when you keep going in, they're barely making it Sunday by Sunday, Wednesday by Wednesday, barely making it in, not on fire, not brushing up against it, and not filled with the Holy Spirit's presence so that you can influence the atmosphere to get more people on fire Who's doing who did the service? The pastor doing you or are you doing the pastor in the church? This isn't on the pastor. This is on us. 
And for all of you people that think that you can elect a person that comes from society that's falling apart, but they're going to be better than us, bigger than us, more morally put together than us, all of a sudden be bigger and better people than we are, than the culture that they came from. Who are you lying to? And I've got friends within different organizations that are doing very well on many fronts at school boards and, and politics. And I'm the guy where, you know, I have, I have the, the fun, awkward conversations like, well, how do we get revival back again? I said, it's easy. Everyone, of course, gives their, you know, first thoughts and I go last. It's easy. They're like, what? I said, burn all the churches down. And they're looking at me like, ah, that's crazy. Steve's crazy. That's nuts. That's Steve. Crazy Steve. Has he been drinking? I don't know. Is it noon? I don't know. Okay, what about this? What that statement was meant to, to say, and they got it, was to remove the middlemen. <laughs> Frank's taken this class before, so it's... I, I say that because, and I'm, by the way, I'm talking to a bunch of pastors when I say this. So, I mean, some non-pastor, but mostly it's, it's, it's a pastor event. And I say this with, with almost a little bit of zeal. They didn't like that at all because I basically indicted them as the problem. And so when I talk to you guys, you're the problem. When I talk to the pastors, they're the problem. When I look in the mirror, I'm the problem. I have to fight for my salvation every day. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling every single freaking day. No days off. Why? Because the world's going to crap, and we're watching Rome burn with Wi-Fi until we're not, until we realize that God's actually called us, and he's given us his word that says the entire world is waiting is in anticipation of the sons of God to arise. If you can't wake up without being your motivating verse every single day, I, I don't know what, what more you need to need, because here's how bad it's gotten. So I was scrolling through social media, and I've got, again, a bunch of solid dudes that do awesome things, and they are regurgitating content from other people all day long. All these political pundits just reposting and reposting, and forgive the expression, right? Shit post after shit post, like it's the same thing. Like we get it, right? The migrants are here. It's, a, it's an army in waiting. All these things are happening. So the moment, by the way, that they cut off giving these, these people money and food and housing, and if God forbid that ever get cut off, the hungry, angry people are going to start doing what? Coming after your money and food and housing. It's, it's already happening. But, but this, is, this is the tragedy. The longer that we go down this path, we keep thinking that someone else better than us is going to do the work and step in. It's not happening. The Word of God is actually showing us and has told us and is trying to reveal to you that the more you press into God and the Holy Spirit, you realize this is, a, this is possibly the greatest rescue mission in yard from hell. And he's put you here on purpose. What are you doing? I'm not saying you need to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm not saying you need to go walking. I'm not saying you need to go spend resources that you really didn't have to go gallivanting. I wasn't on a foodie vacation. I would have loved to have gone to Italy and bought a Moto Guzzi and just like driven around the entire country and like say, sorry, God, you got this, right? You got this. You got other men doing a bunch of other things like this. And so I'm good. I'm just one dude amongst a bunch of other dudes that call themselves Christians and do a bunch of Christian things. And so like, we're all doing this, right? Nope. Again, there's no feather in my cap. I have my assignment. I have my, I have my war. I have my Ephesian armor. But mine is not behind plates of glass and held up with nice lights and a fancy display like a relic of a bygone era. I don't take mine off. I can't tell you how many times I hear from guys, I put on my armor every day. Can, can someone show me the, the book of you that says you can take it off? No, <laughs> it's not there. Uh-oh. And if, 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 we, if we look at this, right, and the reason why I'm trying to say there's an exchange, you can exchange this, this life of Christianity that you've been living, and I'm not saying it's not real to you. I'm not saying you don't have real issues and real testimony and real life and all these things that happened, very incredibly real. But at what point do you stop needing milk and start going for meat? At what point do you understand that the kingdom of heaven, when you pray it down on earth, is not a, is not a kingdom of scraps and leftovers, our fathers, men, eat. So there's food that's going to the enemy. There's food that's going to school board meetings. And there's all these things that we have to be doing in the practical and the natural. But how many of you are also going to war in the supernatural, in the heavenly realms, are taking the word of God as a weapon and speaking it to buildings and laying hands on buildings and going up to people and even waking up saying, God, 
Today's the day. You're going to show me a devil to cast out. Today's the day. Today's, and then it doesn't happen. So the next day, today's the day. And then the next day, today's the day. Every room you walk into, it's this hour. It's right now. It's going to happen. Zealotry. How many of you understand, how many of you have any Muslim friends that you've actually spent some time and actually like cut the fat with and like talked about the Quran and like what they're going to do? <laughs> so if you really spend some time, especially if you find ones that drink a little bit, start to open up. Those are like the best. I've got this, I've had this thing for a while, right? If you don't drink a little bit, I don't know if I trust you, but you know, that's a different story. That's a different men's gathering. I say that because every single one of them I've asked, and it's probably been over two dozen, I said, so your book, you know, that's kind of a little hardcore, right? It says you're supposed to do some stuff. If you feel like it's the last days, you're probably going to, are you going to get a little more serious about your book? He's like, oh yeah, of course. So if you feel like it's the end, you're going to do what? He's like, I don't know. I mean, it says we're supposed to kill people that aren't Muslim. I don't know. So I said, what if everyone else is doing it? They're like, what do you mean everyone? Like, there are hardcore zealots on, on every side of everything. We're seeing a bunch of hardcore zealotry of people who, you know, white kids who are calling black people white supremacists, right? We're seeing zealotry of all sorts of shapes and sizes right now. And it, does, it doesn't take you having to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go walk around the Vatican and pray against it to, to see these things. And so you have all these facets of a bunch of illegal immigrants coming across. And by the way, my uncle, it's the reason why I'm here, he's, he was deported 15 times back to Mexico. The guards finally told him, said, listen, if we catch you again, we're just going to keep you off the books. My mom came here when she was 13 from Guadalajara. Actually, I think from TJ at that point. And so I'm all about productive immigrants coming here and doing amazing things. I think my uncle still has a statue of him in, in Santa Ana. He created Hispanic affairs. Uh, Santa Ana might have a few Hispanic people. I don't know. That's, that might be kind of a, a big deal. I'm, I'm also probably the biggest half Mexican most people have seen. So it's just... I, so I say, that, I say that with a heavy heart because... You guys know what's coming across the border, right? Any of you have any friends in, in border units or border tactical or like any, to any cool guy stuff and they'll tell you how many military aged males with sat phones and full debit cards and cash and directions and GPS coordinates that they're arresting and detaining? Okay, so I'll just, I'll cut the fat. The rough estimate is probably 300,000 directly believed to be military agents in this country. And that's from people that have seen these guys come across the border. 300,000. You know how many active shooter scenarios it would take for them to shut down Fullerton? Two. Two at different areas. Two active shooters in different areas at any given time. And yet you've got guys with sat phones walking around, standing on, on the corners of different places. You've got crime increasing. Go look at Europe. Look at the, look at the videos. On that. You just have to Google them, get past that. Maybe use DuckDuckGo, but you'll see them. There are actually like crowds of Germans and other, other nationalities walking the streets just to combat those other migrants that are now raping and pillaging people, even men. Men are getting raped. Men walking alone at night are getting raped by crowds of, of migrants. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not saying that they don't want the best for these things, but I'm saying what came out of Egypt with the Hebrew people? It's called the rabble, the mixed multitude. It's believed to be those are the people that gave the Israelites golden calves, all, all the input on, on, on worshiping other gods, idolatry. So what's coming across our borders? A mix of a lot of things. We're not prepared for it. Some of you might have enough guns and ammo to, to handle business for you and yours. I love that. Do that. I'll get to a scripture about that in a second. But what I'm trying to say is what's coming here is coming for the rest of the world. And I can tell you that same homelessness, the depravity, the drug use, the vaping, the abuse... The young men that are just out there to defile women, the young women who are out there to just use and abuse men, it is everywhere. The spiritual contagion and component that we helped give the entire world, 2 Timothy chapter 3, is now on display in every single country that I've ever been to over the last three years, which leads me to a very almost kind of like inciting statement. I believe that in 1948 when Israel became a nation started that 70-year clock that puts us kind of like in the end time situation. I know a bunch of you guys go to Calvary Chapel here with Jack. And so, I, I, you know, you go through the math and you realize, okay, so 2018, 70 years is up. 2018, that, you know, the group of, of, of elite deplorables have their gathering on a pandemic. 2019, it gets rolled out. 2020, the first thing happens in all of the last, you know, 1,700 years. 
all churches worldwide shut down at the exact same time. So we know that the first 6,000 years, right, that's God's timing. The last 1,000 years is, is Christ's millennial reign. So at the end of 6,000 years, the time that Jesus is, you know, influencing the world is called the church age. So the last 1,000 is called the kingdom age. So in 2020, what we saw at a worldwide scale is that the church age ended. And we are now transitioning into the kingdom age. And then what do, what do we see in 2021? The first time there's ever a worldwide challenge and a worldwide solution. There's, there's, a, there's a jab, and if you don't take it or take it, the whole world, every country, every society, everywhere had to make the decision. The Bible refers to that as a system, as an antichrist system. Because once that's on the scene, that's a system that the antichrist kind of maneuvers into, takes advantage of, and so we're there. I don't know how much more you need to see. I'm not saying it's tomorrow, because the transitionary periods of the Bible, Noah was 120 years, Moses was 40 years, Malachi did, John the Baptist was 400 years. How many of you think that we can handle 40, even 400 years of this. Anyone? Okay, so if it's on display, if it's in the word, show of hands. How many of your pastors are talking about rapture? Like it's on the table. Show of hands. Okay, how many people, how many pastors are talking about remnant? Oh, come on. I don't see. Yell it out. If I can't see a hand, yell it out. Anyone? I see one hand in the back that was like a sneaky little hand. What's the remnant? We know that Jesus is here for a thousand years. So that means Christians are here for a thousand years. We know that Revelation 20 says cowards won't enter heaven. So if Jesus died on the cross for our sins and then conquers the grave to restore our power, authority, and dominion so that we can trample all things, have dominion, right? Everything. And your pastor is telling you that you get a hall pass out, and you get a hall pass, and you get a hall pass, and you get a hall pass, and everyone gets, everyone gets a hall pass out. You don't even have to think about being here. Because bye, hall pass, it's hall pass, we're going, let's grab my hand, let's go, let's go see Jesus. Okay, so God sacrifices his only son for us to have power, authority, and dominion to restore what Adam really messed up. And you don't think it's cowardly to just want a rapture out of here? So the Bible then says, Babylon falls in, eight, in Revelation 18, 18, 20. It says, cowards don't enter heaven. I just want to ask you this question. What do you say to God when you have your exit interview and, and you're like, man, thanks, that was close. I almost had to be persecuted. I almost had to die from my faith. Whoo! That's f awesome. Man, Jesus, and that, the blue beam and the light just like took us up and like everything else. But hey, it's cool though, right? Like we're here. Like where's the gold? Where's the mansions? We're here. Like where's my keys? And he's just staring at you. He puts you here on the greatest rescue mission in your yard from hell and you're celebrating getting out with a hall pass. And you don't want to be called coward. You don't want to be questioned. Everyone thinks that they're going to be told just because they got out in the rapture, well done, good and faithful servant. Who are we? I mean, outside of liars. How many of you, again, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to address is you're being spoken to about a rapture. Spoken to as if it's the predominant thing to focus on and what does it do? It disengages you from the very tedious, difficult work of getting your ass kicked by mentioning Christ and possibly being hated and vilified and ultimately decapitated. Why do you think that the saints in heaven cry out for God to render judgment? Because things go sideways. And people are here through it and experience it and are tormented for it. And so I'm not saying that your pastors are setting you up for a fall. I'm just saying you have the opportunity of engaging your faith now on this side of heaven. You're a spiritual being surrounded by spiritual beings calling out to a spiritual God going to a spiritual place. And you don't even know who your spirit is. You don't desire spiritual gifts. How do you even know, as the Bible says, the seal and guarantee of Christianity is the Holy Spirit's mark on you? And you're being spoken to more about the mark of the beast than the mark of God. You have to exchange this tepid, lukewarm version of Christianity 
for being a full-blown criminal as it relates to Australian police calling you an extremist. So I'm addressing the heart. It's the want. Your pastor's going to say whatever your pastors say. I've already told you, you're the pastor six days a week. So you don't get a pass. Your pastor, no one gets a pass. They will be judged harsher than you will. But you still have to say, God, what is, you know, you'll have to explain your heart posture to God. And if your heart posture is rapture, show of hands. Who, who wants to just lay a hand on someone and heal them instantly? Be pretty cool, right? How many people have sick people in their lives? Cancer riddled people, right? Pastor Mike. How many of you wouldn't just do whatever you could in faith to make sure that guy's healed on the spot? Okay, what, what about dead people that die prematurely? We're kind of seeing a lot of that right now, right? Young kids dying on the field. Young adults, you know, dying. S- sads, sudden adult. How many, how, many, how many of you wouldn't want to defy the enemy's plan and bring those people back? Show of hands, anyone want that? So you, you actually want what the Bible has to offer you. What are you willing to do to get that? Amen. This is the greatest exchange that you're going to be faced with. A form of godliness but denying its power to a form of godliness but full of his power. That's your exchange. I don't need to drag this out. We can talk about this at length again. I don't want a hostage negotiation. At this point, we don't even have any fancy music. Like This is as... as down and dirty as it gets. If any of you are sideways on your faith and you need to come back and make an amends, don't even want to eyes closed, I want to show of hands. Right? It's, it's time to come back home. Okay? That's one group. Next group. Who's ready to exchange the form of godness with no power for form of godness with power? Show of hands. Big, bold hands. Okay? I need all of you to stand. Who raised a hand? In fact, I need, I need you guys to come down here and just make a group. Come down here. I need you to stand shoulder to shoulder. I need you to actually place your hand on each other's shoulder. I, and I, um, before I even get into the prayer, I need all of you guys to just start praying out loud. Start praying out loud. You're seeking God's heart and his face. You want, you want his ears to hear you. You want him to understand that you actually are done playing games and done with this baby faith. It's repentance, right? It's confessing things. It's saying things out loud. There's no judgment here. There's only the Holy Spirit's presence and your heart and desire to make this happen. How bad do you want this? How bad do you want the exchange from a form of godliness with no power to exactly what the Bible has to offer? Why is this the loudest you can get right now? There's one guy in the front of this screaming out to God right now. Why isn't this place filled? If it hurts, get the hurt out. If there's pain, get the pain out. Amen. Start confessing it. Start confessing it. Whatever's heavy on you, whatever burdens are there, start confessing it out loud. And don't stop until you know that you've gotten God's attention in his heart. All of you, that's it. That's it. I hear nothing on this side. There's no yell in this man. Any, any yell in this right now? What do you have? What are you going to tell God right now? In the council of all these witnesses, what do you tell God? Silence? Louder. Louder. Get it out. Start yelling it. All these guys over here. Why isn't there something louder? If you're done, you're done, but... Amen, All right, this is going to be fast and quick, and when I'm done... If you want that warrior's heart and you're desiring your spiritual gifts, you're already laying hands on each other. That's what the Bible requires. I'm going to need, by the time I'm done praying, every single man here to yell at the top of his lungs. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're so grateful for what you've done. Jesus, 
Jesus, we need you. We need you every single day, wherever we go, all throughout the day. Holy Spirit, we can do none of this without you. It's your way or no other way, Father. It's, your, it's our obedience to what you said or it's nothing at all, Lord. We claim right now we're standing in the gap on behalf of ourselves and where we've come from and where we need to be, Lord. We're desiring more of you, Father. In the name of Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against my family, against myself, Lord. The gates of hell will not claim people in suicide. The gates of hell will not come for brothers and sisters who are trying to come forward, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I ask that you meet these men where they are. I ask that you cleanse them as they repent and cry out to you, Father, that you are meeting them where they're at, Lord. And I pray to God right now that all these men will step forward in faith like never before. This is the time that your men step forward onto the stage of history. This is the time that no man will go unaccounted for, where his faith will rise to that of giants that we read about in the book. And they will start to read about us and our lives and how our exploits are on display. Father, right now, I ask that you bless each and every one of these men. I ask that you speak to them in dreams and visions and prophecy, Lord, that the spirit of prophecy step forward, that they rise up in their voice, Lord, that they speak to the generations, Father, to the, to the elderly, to the young people, the children, Lord, and they raise up generations of faith-filled Christians that are done playing games and are done desiring a rapture and a hall pass. In the name of Jesus, Father, rise your men. Rise them now. Father, as I place this mic down, Lord, you are bringing them forward. We love you. We trust you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You guys are awesome. I need you to do that at home. I need you to do that in the waking hours when God calls you forward. Again. This is game time. This is, this is it. Everyone's talking about rapture. Everyone's talking about the 23rd. Everyone's talking about, you know, all these things that we're seeing in the signs and heavens. I don't know how much more you need to see, how much more you want, but the reality is this is now. If you want to get prayed for, I'm, I'm not leaving until every man gets, gets prayed for. If you want to get baptized, there's a pullback there. I'll give you a free T-shirt. You get baptized. I'm just saying that not to entice you. I'm just saying, like, if there's a heavy burden on your heart and it needs to get accomplished tonight and it gets spoken to tonight, I want you, uh, if, if you guys are heavy and you're there, pray for each other. Make a line. Let's, Frank and I, Pastor Mike and I, will start praying for people. But listen, what's burdening you has to fall tonight, has to die tonight. You have to go home and rise up differently than how you left this place and you woke up this morning. I appreciate you. That's it. That's all I got.